So I want to go ahead and kick off our conversation with our first guest. Now we are starting off hot off the fire with this woman and her story. Some of you may have actually seen her story in the news a few years ago. Alyssa Hogan. Alyssa went from being a preschool teacher, a mother and a wife, to being an accused murderer for stabbing her then husband in a fight. The jury found her not guilty because she was defending herself after nine years of abuse. She was able to rise from the ashes of this situation to now be the founder, principal consultant, and lead trainer of Elisa A. Hogan Enterprises, where she provides one-on-one -on -one small business, leadership coaching, and training. Now, Elisa, I'm not sure, you know, I, I was thinking about your story, and there's so many layers to it about where to really begin. But I really want to talk to you about the effects of incarceration. Listen, I was in jail for 24 hours. And just within that 24-hour time, I was about to lose my life. It was a lot for me. But I also knew that I was going to be released. For you, your freedom was hanging by a thread and was going to have to be decided by a jury of your peers. Tell us about the effects that time being incarcerated had on you and the uncertainty about your future. Alyssa dropped off Marjorie. Oh, well, okay. Well, we will just move on to our next guest then until she comes back, right? <laughs> or do we want to, oh, there she is. She's coming on now. This happens. Yes. Can you hear us? Happening. Yes, everything's <laughs> happening today. <laughs> Not a problem. Now, did you get to hear my first question to you? No. Okay. I heard, I heard your story, and I thought you were actually talking about me, and I was like, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that something? All right. So, you know, basically, I was saying, you know, you spent some time in jail, and um, you know, for me, I spent 24 hours, and it was a lot just for me mentally, emotionally, but I knew that I was going to be released. For you, you had no idea what was going to happen next. So tell us about the effect that time had on you and the uncertainty of your future. Well, when I would describe my time in, it's like 30 days, 30 nights. You know, when you talk, you read the story of Jesus going into the mountains and those 30 days were like a awakening period for me. So it wasn't actually trauma being in there. I felt as though I deserved to be there. So I, I liked being away from everybody. I was away from the reality and I was in, in there in my own safe space. So I felt safe, secluded, isolated. Um, yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't trauma to me. My reason for being in there was the trauma. So I, I had time to escape it for 30 days by focusing on other people's problems. That is interesting. You know, and it's so funny you say that because I know for me in that 24 hours while I was in there, and I write about this in my book, um, I met a lot of women who were also there because of some sort of altercation with men, right? And it was through those little bit of conversations that I had, I knew and I realized that night that God was going to do something with my situation. I didn't know what and I didn't know how, but I knew that was going to happen. So, so it was traumatizing for me. But for you, you saw it as a time that you you were sort of self-reflecting and then you focused on others. So by the time as you were released, did you have a plan of action about your life, about what you, the next step was going to be? Actually, no. Um, being released was... I had mixed feelings. I didn't know if I was ready to be released. 
And right before I was going home, I thought I was going home to hug my children. And I found out from my uncle on a phone call right before I was supposed to be released that the judge had put a no contact order. I had three children. They were my life. So you're thinking it now. And my only reason for wanting to be out was to be around them. But I realized that I'm not going back to the same bed that I slept in prior to being put in there. And everything outside had changed. So it was like those 30 days, my life stood still. And then I had to go back out and deal with where I had just left during that period. It's so funny because yours is in November. So mine happened in November. Wow. 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 That, that for me, even more like, you know, I had no idea once I was released from jail, what was going to happen next. Like I thought, okay, I could go back home. I could, you know, or I could go see my child. And I, I had no idea that, you know, it was going to get worse. And I think for me, the traumatic thing was not seeing my child, my six-year-old child, not being able to be with my child. So when you're in a situation like that, it is hard to make plans because you don't know minute by minute what the next thing is going to happen. You know, life is so uncertain. So tell us about, um, you know, your faith, how much your faith played a role in, you know, moving forward through that. Oh, my God. Um, actually, I have to be honest, right before I went in, I had completely lost faith. Mm. I had told God, listen, um, I did what you said, I'm married, I was faithful, I pray, I go to church every Sunday. Um, our first date was in the church. So we were there every Sunday, but my prayers felt unanswered. It was like my marriage got worse, my life got worse. And now here I was being told that I was being booked for murder and that my husband was gone, the person that that I loved. I mean, I loved him even though our relationship was a roller coaster. It was toxic. And I did not rebuild my relationship with God until that day I found out in the station that that I was, they told me, because I didn't know he was deceased. They told me that my, my ex-husband was dead and I just fell on the floor and just felt like I couldn't breathe. And I was, I started talking to him. I was like, why would you allow, I'm a good person. I'm a teacher. You know, I, I dedicate my time. I'm a good mom. I was a good wife. How could you allow this to happen to me? Mm -hmm. And that was my first time I could hear him clearly speaking to me and saying, I never left you. Mm -hmm. I've been here the entire time, but because you were so wrapped up in everything that was going on in your life, you couldn't hear me. Yeah. 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 Wow. Wow. So tell us then now, as time goes on and you know that you have to pick up the pieces of your life, what was that defining moment for you that, you know, you realized, okay, I'm going to have to rise out of this. I cannot stay here. I have to move forward. What was that for you? I don't think it was like a specific moment. It was like pieces of the puzzle um, that were being put together. So every day was a moment of, you know, oh my God, I'm, I'm waking up. It's not a dream. You know, I'm waking up to a nightmare is what I felt. And sleep in two hours. And so it was that that moment of, okay, I haven't lost my mind. I'm still here. I was checking to make sure I wasn't crazy that day. So every day there was something I was learning, some lesson. People were still actually calling me, family and friends, asking me for advice while I was pending trial. And let's finish up with her. So sorry about that. <laughs> no, we were just getting into the story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So listen, um, so I actually just had like, you 
you know, one more question for you. But then, and you had, we had ended it where you said that, you know, you, you had sort of lost your faith, but I know you found it again. Okay. Oh, I found it beyond okay. found it. Yeah. So tell us about that. Tell us how you found that again. Well, first of all, um, when I was in jail, I had the first person that came up to me because I was in isolation at first. And when I came out of isolation, I went into maximum security and um, a young lady approached me and she actually told me she was a prostitute and she wanted to give me a Bible. And I just looked at her like a Bible ain't did nothing for me in these last few years. So, I mean, I don't know what you want me to do with it, but these women kept coming to me. And at, at the time, cause I went back in isolation um, because my story was high profile, it was on the news. Mm -hmm. I was listening to women next to me, 21 year olds on both sides that were preparing to go to prison that were just going through some brokenness. And then I started, cause I was in the same system. I was a child protective investigator. Then I switched over and became a social worker for over 10 years. So I was in this system where I was going in removing kids, helping families and going home where my house was a mess. Mm. Mm -hmm. So as I began to listen to their stories and realize that my life had been spared. Wow. I was so worried about, I just carried so many things, the guilt, yeah. not feeling like a strong woman. You know, people wrote, um, when I got out, they wrote on Facebook, they were, you know, writing up under my story and they were saying, they didn't know me and they were saying, oh, she must've did it because she, you know, she was jealous. You know, it was like women were bashing me they were saying, well, how could she work in the school system and, right. you know, and, and, and have all this going on? We never saw bruises on her. And it was like all these myths that were so not true. Right. You don't have to see bruises on someone for them to be abused. I would never let you, I would never show up in public because I had a reputation. I was a professional. Mm -hmm. Right. And I realized it was so many women like me. I didn't even qualify for the battered woman syndrome. They right. said I was too educated. Right. And the fact that I had a job and a car yeah. that I, I didn't. Yeah, yeah. You did. It's almost as like, well, you don't qualify for any of the resources. You basically have to be dragging barefoot and, you know, just broken. And un people. Yeah, uneducated and everything. Yeah, but yeah. They don't realize that domestic violence comes at all levels. It's not just black women. It's not yeah. white women. It's one out of three when you walk in a room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's and that's something that I discovered very quickly too. And one of the reasons why I started to do the work that I was doing because women who were not physically abused, if they were emotionally, psychologically, and financially. There was no support and no resources for them. So they, they, there was nowhere for them to really go for that kind of, of help. So I know and I understand that. And the other thing I connect with so quickly that you just said was getting that Bible, because I remember we had Bible study that night. And the Bible that they gave me in jail, I still have that Bible. <laughs> I oh, wow. still have that Bible today. Um, and, and it was, it's something about that moment of when you are you just stripped of everything and you've got nothing but God, right? At that moment. Nothing. That's yeah. exactly what it was. The stripping yeah. of teacher, wife, mother, yeah. yes. nothing. Financially, yeah. you were equal to these women that were in there. And that's what he told me. Exactly. Exactly. So now it becomes a, a journey of self-discovering, self-rediscovering of who you really are, right? Yeah. And, and that, that is, that's part of the Phoenix moment. That's part of that um, you know, rising from the ashes that when you realize who you really are and your worth, and then you see that your life and your, what, what you went through, because just like me, you realize, okay, this is more than just about me. These women in here, they need somebody 
right? So now you you come out of this and you're you decided you're going to go out, you're going to share your testimony, you're going to you know start your businesses. So tell us about the work that you're doing now and why you decided to do that. Well, my first experience of sharing my story, I didn't come out the house for probably a year after I was released because the shame, the guilt. So what I decided to do was I only went out when I was going to the therapist okay. and yeah. and one of somebody saw me that knew me prior to the incident and they were just in shock. They were like, oh, my God, you don't look like what you've been through. Can you come speak at an event? And I was like, you want me to speak? I don't know what I'm going to speak about. She was like, just tell your story. And that's where everything began. I was so emotionally distraught after that first speaking engagement. Yeah. yeah. Because I kept and I healed things back. There was still a lot of guilt. But as I began to be asked to speak more after that, yeah. I began to release the chains and realize that I wasn't alone. Women mm -hmm. came up to me and said, oh my God, how did you start this business? Yeah, I'm inspired. I saw yes. you on TV. I prayed for you. And I was like, oh my God, mm -hmm. they were treating me like I was a celebrity. And I was at that time, my car had been repoed. I was staying on my dad's futon. I didn't have a job. I started working at the labor pool. I had a master's degree making $8 an hour stocking shelves. Mm -hmm. Wow. But you know what? <clears throat> they were looking at you and you were a model of overcoming that situation. It's not about the money you were making and the car you drive in, but they saw you as this overcomer in that situation. And that is it, the, just the, the modeling of that and the way you were carrying yourself. And I'm sure that's what opened more doors for you. It and, is. Yeah, 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 that's beautiful. That's beautiful. You know, I thank you so much, Elisa, because when I first heard your story <clears throat> at Women on the Rise, and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, there was so much, you know, and we were supposed to get together and sit down and talk, and we never did. But when I knew I was doing this, I wanted to have you on and just sort of talk about, you know, how you came through and what happened to you. And if you could get through that, the ordeal of that, and be here today and doing what you're doing, um, being a leader in the community as well. That is a, a perfect example right there of rising from the ashes and being able to use your voice and your story to help other women and other people in the community. So thank you again for, for being on with us today. And um, please stick around because we might have some questions for you at the end, okay? Yeah, I have one more comment. Sure. And it's gonna be short. I just wanted to, if anybody was listening to this, if they have any family or friends or anything that have been in a situation where they're, they could be on pending trial or in prison currently for the similar charges to mm -hmm. mine, my case was the first case of Stand Your Ground where a woman that's in a domestic violence situation is allowed to stand her ground and it be considered self-defense and she is not guilty because i was acquitted and so if i don't know who this might help but i just oh, wanted to share thank you so much for sharing that i had no idea wonderful and if you guys want to reach out to lisa you can um in the chat just um type in her name send her a question and um we had her um on facebook you can find her at elisa hogan as well. So thanks for sharing that. Thank 